and welcome to the very first episode of my podcast, Attention Engineer. I'm Laura Kidd, aka Penfriend a solo artist, producer and songwriter living in Bristol and beaming music videos and podcasts at you from my home studio, The Launchpad. In this noisy world, the gift of someone's attention is priceless, so thank you for tuning in. In return, I promise to ask the questions journalists won't, to go past the headlines and the hearsay, to have the conversations I've always hoped for with some of the artists I admire the most. This podcast is supported by Arts Council England and the National Lottery, and powered by the Correspondence Club. I'll tell you more about that later on. I hope you're well, dear listener, and getting through the week as best you can in these turbulent times. It's a strange moment to be putting new things into the world, but as my favourite podcaster Andy J. Pizza says in his brilliant series Creative Pep Talk, making art is an act of hope, especially right now. I've been thinking about and working on this series for absolutely ages, and I'm just so excited to start sharing all these deeply interesting, insightful, beautifully honest conversations with you. First up, it's only polite to issue a content warning for one mild swear word. Sorry, that was my fault. Now, to my guest. Tanya Donnelly is a two-time Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter, solo artist, and founding member of three influential bands of the post-punk era, namely Belly, Throwing Muses, and The Breeders. Her upcoming album of covers recorded with the Parkington Sisters is due to be released on August the 14th, 2020. I first started chatting to Tanya online in 2013 when I heard about her Swan Song series, five beautiful collaborative EPs released over the course of six months. As a massive fan of all things Tanya, I was delighted to get so many new songs, but dismayed that they apparently signalled her exit from music making. Somehow, our chats led to an invitation to sing backing vocals for Tanya when she came to Bristol, opening for and playing with Throwing Muses in 2014, and so we got to meet for the first time. It was a real dream come true to sing those brilliant songs with her, and I got up the courage to invite Tanya to duet with me on one of my songs the following year. This podcast really is an excuse for me to be nosy with artists I admire, so it's fitting that someone who had such an impact on me as a young wannabe singer is my first guest of what I hope will be a long-running series. We spoke on Wednesday the 25th of March, two days into the UK lockdown. Over to Tanya now to set the scene from her home in Boston. I'm impressed that you, um, just your tech savviness always impresses me oh thanks because uh, yeah I am the opposite of that what level are you at uh, just a lot I guess <laughs> oh, it's just I mean I'm getting in this new reality that we're living in I'm having to get better at it just to work and see people and maintain yeah. sanity but so tell yeah. me about what's been going on with you in the last few weeks then because we're behind you, I think, in the UK. You are a little bit behind us. Um, and I think you're going to be where we are in, in about a week, to be honest. Right. Um, um, it's, I mean, I feel like I kind of got it a little late in the game. You know, it was about three weeks ago that, I, that things started to be, that it started to become very clear that we were going to be following Italy's trajectory pretty tightly. Um, Mm. and so it, you know, it it just same path it, that everyone sort of slowly slipping into, which is, you know, it started with school shutting down. Um, Gracie came home from college, her semester was canceled. Uh, that was sort of the first thing that happened. And then Hattie's school was canceled. And then, um, from there, all non-essential businesses, no, you know, restaurants, the only things that are open right now are grocery stores and gas stations and medical facilities. Um, And we sort of went on to official lockdown the day before yesterday, meaning that now it's a, it's an actual offense to be choosing to socialize. Wow. It went from recommendation to, to mandate. 
the day before yesterday. So I don't want to be a harbinger of doom, but I do feel mm-hmm. like this is months we're looking at. Yeah, I'd so, say so. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So it's a funny time to just start asking you about music and things and have a chat <laughs> with you for this. But I also feel like for me, I have to just keep doing some stuff. So this is one of the things that's really helping me get through the week, really. Yeah. So, well, I could I could stop and stare at the news all day, but that's actually not going to help anyone. Right. No, it's really not. And it's that's been something that we've also been, you know, keeping a lid on is how much watch enough and read enough to know what today has brought, what new <laughs> restrictions, you know, um, but otherwise I'm staying away from it. Before all this, I had a really good system of not looking at anything till quite late in the day anyway. And then of mm-hmm. course it's all going on and it just, um, it's too, too easy to just check everything again and again and again. So yeah. I, I've, I've managed to um, push it back a little bit more, which means I can do more creative things because that's right. what I do. So I have to keep doing those things. And I have to say, like, I'm genuinely not looking for silver linings in this situation, no. <laughs> personal silver linings, but I have, Gail and I wrote three songs this week, Y'all, you know, just so there are, just the writing has, I've been writing a lot. and That's good to hear. Yeah, and reading a lot. And so that's those, and reading, for me, reading always leads to writing. Um, so that's also part of why I think, um, just time and then also, you know, focus. So just having, um, having these, this huge expanse of, you know, time, you know, chunks of the day that I'm not used to having just to mm. focus is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. We all, all have to do something with our time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was trying to do good things <laughs> with it. So. so I wrote a song about, um, about what's going on on Monday and then I performed it this morning and I'm still kind of like, did you? Um, the sort of adrenaline and sort of, of horror of, of yeah. like the stress I decided to put myself under to do right. that today. I'm still feeling quite weird yeah. in my body at the moment. Right. For me, songwriting is something I used to process what's going on. So it makes mm-hmm. sense that I would do that now. It feels weird doing it because I don't know. It just feels weird. It feels like, well, that, that hasn't solved anything. But Except that people really are genuinely... Um grateful for it you know which yeah. and I was just actually talking I was supposed to do a residency at a, a local pub slash club here and um I just was talking to them yesterday about how to do it we're trying to set up an online way to do it so I'm gonna be figuring that out my, myself soon so that's good yeah but I'm, I have exactly the same fear that you <laughs> the same anxiety around it that just well, it's like, it's... you know, oh, artist cashes in mm. on coronavirus to create a song. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just disgusting, isn't it? But, but I'm, I'm working on a lot of this stuff. I've just, I'm on, I'm on week 12 of The Artist's Way, the Julia Cameron book. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did that years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And she, I mean, there's a whole bit about this feeling in there, which mm-hmm. is like, you know, this whole who do you think you are to be an artist thing. Just, it's just right. such a waste of time. But I feel like most of us, um, most of the people I talk to anyway, definitely feel this way. Yeah. So we're all surviving and you're yep. writing music, which is very exciting, yes. but we haven't, we haven't really sort of got around to who you are on this podcast because I, I just assume everyone loves you the same amount that I do. Oh. But then there may be people who are like, Tanya who? <laughs> yes, there will be plenty of them. <laughs> so for those people, do you, how would you describe yourself or how would you introduce yourself to a stranger? Uh, I mean, apart from two meters distant. <laughs> now I describe myself as a singer songwriter. Um, and then that also always leads to the resume. So, um, yeah, the bands that I've been in. Yeah, of course. But yeah, at the moment I say singer songwriter. I don't really say musician anymore um, mm. as I once did, I guess, because that's what I focus on most these days is writing. So. Mm-hmm. And so for you, what's the distinction then? What would make you call yourself a musician and not sing a songwriter? I feel like it makes my role in in whatever project I'm involved in more clear. Okay. You know, and then, you know, I play guitar as a sort of adjunct to that. Okay. <laughs> Peace. That's how I feel now. That's just the current, the current feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And are you doing anything else outside of music at the moment? No, I mean, no, no, because there's no, um, I mean, I've been an on and off doula for several years. 
postpartum doula, uh, which I, is a, it's great. First of all, I love the work, but it also just really plugs in perfectly with music work because one, you know, I, t- I take gigs on either side as I can and they, you know, it's a easy to weave into music work in terms of schedule. Um, of course, right now there is zero, nothing, none of that is happening right now. So I do that also to, it's to sort of supplement music. When did you realize that you wanted to make music? Throwing music started when you were, was it 15 officially? But you must have been playing before then. Yeah, it was, we were 14 when we started playing, when we started playing guitar and when we started taking, um, I think Kristen actually, Kristen took lessons at school in eighth grade. So she was a little bit, maybe six months ahead of me. And then we just sort of started, both of our dads play, play guitar and, you know, and her father writes, he actually wrote the chorus to Not Too Soon, her father. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, the first part of the chorus is from a song that he wrote that we used to play with him. Mm-hmm. So we sort of started playing with, honestly, we started by playing Beatles, Beatles covers, just teaching ourselves Beatles songs and like make a Beatles songbook and, and a chord book to learn, you know. Very quickly, Kristen started writing and, and I sort of followed suit so by the time we were 15 we were it was all originals that we were doing and started getting gigs when we were like 16 I guess yeah does that strike you as incredibly young now that you have girls of your own it does except except that they it, it does seem young yes but they're performers also so they both act and have been since they were little and singing and they're they both play and write and uh, so I feel like, I actually feel, I think it was very, it seemed very young at the time, not to us, because I don't think you ever feel young when you're young, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was pointed out to us, you know, it was a novelty that we were as young as we were. Um, I feel like the curve is very, everything, you know, things just curve young now. So it probably wouldn't feel as unusual now, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, like 15 and 16 is about when people start getting noticed sometimes now, you know. So, yeah, as the norm. Yeah, true. I was just feel like for me, throwing music is being so young and so good was what, what was incredible to me. Because I started playing music when I was, I don't know, like 14, 15, but I was no oh. good. <laughs> so, oh. like, like no good. Doubt that. So, um. <laughs> I just, I was just always like, whoa, and they're, and they're genuinely brilliant. Did you know you were? I will tell you there was a, obvious, there was a lot of chaff as well as wheat. (laughs) Oh, okay. Well, that's good to hear, I think. That no one will ever hear. (laughs) I think that's really important as well to know, especially if there's any other artists listening that, that even you had rubbish (laughs) songs you chose not to share. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There was actually one point where, um, when Belly was doing well and we had a lot of, you know, um, we need a song for this, we need a song for that. And and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go back and I'm going to mine the depths of my early stuff and see if there's anything there. And there was, it was just an exercise in self-punishment. Oh, no. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, no, I'm going to leave all that right where it is. <laughs> no treasure there. Burn the evidence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So there won't be a, a sort of deep dive of no, stuff, no, no, no. stuff coming out. Nope. <laughs> What's the thing you're most proud of creating so far? Oh, my God. Um, the last Belly album, Dove, um, is one of my favorite things that I've ever done. And I love my solo series, the solo mm. series of EPs that I did, the co-written thing called Swan Songs. Um, Swan Song series. That I am very proud of because it was just a real, just writing with so many different people, so many different artists and being able to, to take what they gave me and turn it into a song was just one of the most gratifying experiences of my life. And also just that sense of this broad community 
and the, all of the very different ways that those songs came together. It was just a very exciting project. And, uh, you know, I mean, probably ongoing. I think I'm going to do, do more. And as, you know, as, as, as we're all sitting at home, people are sending each other music. And so that's probably going to kickstart again. Was it called Swan Song because you thought it was going to be the last thing? <laughs> yes. Very dramatic. How did that go? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not really sure, you know, what my mindset was at the time. And I don't know why I felt like I had to throw myself a going away party because I just sort of felt like, oh, there was just this odd little moment in time when I felt it seemed like things had slowed to the point where maybe I wasn't going to be doing it anymore. And I was working full time as a doula at that point, too. And really loving that. And I just entered into this odd little black and white moment where I just thought, all right, I'm done. And I'm just going to end this by inviting all of these artists that I've wanted to write with to write songs with me. And and I'm going to go out with that sort of community spirit. And, and then it just immediately was so healthy and pleasurable and wonderful that it, you know, became, the swan songs basically became more of a tongue in cheek thing. And they're beautiful. How many was there all together? 30 something songs. Um, That's such a lot of work, <laughs> but like great work. That must have taken a long time. Right. But there was no, it did take a long time, but because it was all DIY initially and very, there was no deadline, you know, and also I just really spread the net wide. So I had a lot of music coming in, mm. but yeah, it, it was a long, it was a long project and, and again, still sort of open-ended. That's really good to hear. Yeah. I just want more and more music from you, please. Oh, you're, and well, vice versa. I want more and more from you. Although you're so incredibly prolific. <laughs> I don't have to. I don't feel like it, but I'm trying my best. Oh, you are. <laughs> You are, your work ethic, and I've said it to you before, is inspiring. Thanks. So glad I pressed record. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> then I'm feeling really rubbish. Maybe I could say that back to myself. It's <laughs> really kind of you to say. How do you feel about creativity at this moment in time in the world and with everything that's going on? I think we're going to get a lot of music out of this. And I think we're going to get a lot of literature. And I think, I think, um, I think this is going to end up being, you know, there's no way to spin this as a positive moment in history. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to do that, but I do think there a lot of work is getting done in a lot of studios and homes right now. Yeah. So again, not, not a silver lining, but <laughs> it's hard to talk about anything that isn't the really big, serious topics of the day and feel like it's worth anything or can be compared to it. But mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the day-to-day -day life that people live is really valuable. Yeah. So it's not just what's happening at the higher levels that we need to be focusing on. Right. I think all those beautiful little interactions between people mm -hmm. are really important. And Absolutely. You know, making things is really important. And Yeah. But it's, it's a balance, isn't it? It is. For my life, I know I have to make things, otherwise I just, I feel really horribly depressed. Yeah. But it's not that I think that everybody else needs to listen to those things. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> they can choose not to. Right. But I mean, in the, but people do want to listen to it. So that's perfect. That's nice too. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's okay. I also just feel like people, you know, I've had a few conversations with artist friends in terms of just the practical self-education that's happening right now, you know, learning how to use tools that people, especially of my generation, I'm going to say, aren't maybe, you know, don't have a facility for mm -hmm. learning how to manage and understand the, the tools that recording tools and business and, you know, in place of putting those decisions and that work in hands that are maybe less invested. Yes. <laughs> in what you're doing. I mean, I will always, always, always want to work in a studio with engineers that I trust and love, but it, it's also been good for me in terms of figuring out how to, how to be genuinely more DIY, you know, DIY. Yeah. Cause we have all these tools, you know, so they are yeah. there for us in good times and bad. 
Right. Is that how you and Gail have been writing then? If you've been sending stuff to each other? Yeah, we've just been sending files, files back and forth. Excellent. Yeah, it is. And Chris played drums on a couple of them so far too. So it's just sort of, I mean, part of it is just, she's just been writing so much lately. So I just... It's like, okay, send it all. And she's sending me things also where she's playing drums, bass, guitar. It's like I've been calling her, calling her Little Prince. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's been amazing to you. This is what I mean, just in terms of her in her basement. You know, I hear this drum part in my head. I'm just going to play it. You know, it's just it's exciting to, you know, I think a lot, and yeah, and I'm sure that's not an isolated story. I'm going to guess that a lot of people are learning exactly what they can do. Well, that is good. Yeah. I've always tried to um, encourage people to do that myself because it was such a turning point for me learning how to record myself mm -hmm. from a laptop years ago. And my husband, Tim, who you've met, yes. I'll say, say it for people who are listening who have not met him, <laughs> he's a concert promoter, but he's also a brilliant songwriter. And he um, has been wanting to learn how to record himself. And, and I offered to, to do some recording for him. And I just thought, to be honest, in that kind of stressful situation with someone probably shouldn't be with someone who you're married to if you want things <laughs> to go well. Right. So I just thought, you know what, why don't you learn to do it yourself so that we don't have to have an argument when you get frustrated because <laughs> recording is such a personal thing, you know. Right. That's why I prefer to do it alone because I might sort of, I think I might be a bit grumpy with someone sometimes if they're recording me because it's, it's emotional, it's hard, you feel really on the spot. Yes, yeah. It's a very vulnerable position to be in, yeah. Yeah, I just don't think that, that we need to put our relationship under that sort of stress. So I've been trying to teach him how to, to teach himself to do it sort of thing. And I, and I think that just gives you so much power and, and, it's, and it's not even hard. And once you get going, it's just, it just opens up a whole world of possibilities. Yeah. That's how I've got to the point where I'm recording my entire album in this room I'm in. Anyway, I, I started it last summer doing it that way. Mm -hmm. But it took me that long to realise I actually did have the skills to do it. And then I send it to my amazing mix engineer, Dan Austin, who mixes it for me. And then it sounds like it was done in a posh studio. That's fantastic. And that's nice. So, I mean, yeah. I guess I have all the control I want. It doesn't cost very much money. Right. And for me, it's about not really having too many um, barriers between me and the listener, too. I'm quite right. into that idea. So When I work alone, I feel like I have, like I could just keep tweaking forever. So, you know, do you feel like you have a sense of what your healthy stopping point is? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> the next time I record 25 identical bass takes, I will uh, send them to you. You can tell me how insane I've got. No, thank you. <laughs> what we all do in our work is really just always going to be a reach. You know, like mm -hmm. what we're trying to say is going to be what we're trying to say yeah and so you do have you know you have to come to a point where you're like okay this represents what I'm trying to do as closely as I'm gonna get <laughs> I'd like to know in which part of your musical life do you feel most comfortable Ooh, um most comfortable is writing lyrics um that's the thing that I feel I wouldn't say confident because that's a silly word. I mean, it's, I'm trying to think of a word because I'm thinking everything, it's not easy, but that's, I feel like it's the most, that's where I'm most comfortable is words and playing loud <laughs> with belly <Yeah>. on stage. <laughs> like there's something about that too. I'm very, having that volume around me that feels very comfortable to me too. So those are probably the two. Lyr lyrics and noise. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Are my two comfortable <laughs> places. <laughs> it sounds like it could be your, um, your subtitle. Tanya Donnelly, Lyrics mm. and Noise. Lyrics and Noise. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still enjoy touring? You've toured a for a long time. How's that? Yeah, very much. Um, it, was, it was really fun. I mean, yes, I love, I love playing live with those people and I love uh, traveling and so yeah touring is it's hard to you know clearly to be away from my husband my children and my dog um the way that we chunked it up on this last couple of tours it was perfect like we do 
three weeks and then come home for a couple of weeks and then go back out three weeks and come home for, it was just the perfect rhythm. Mm. I don't know that I would want to leave these people for longer than that, but it's just, and it also keeps it extremely friendly that way too on the road. (laughs) Yeah, of course. It's really fun. I mean, I love touring. I always have. It's funny because it's such an unnatural Mm. state to live in. Mm. I've, I've always really loved it too. And I just wonder what it is about, I don't know, what do we all have in our personalities that makes us want to sit in confined spaces, lift things in and out of rooms <laughs> and then stand and show off and then do, you know, reverse the, the process. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> right. I mean, I think part of it for me is that that's a, that the touring feels like, okay, this feels like work. Mm, yeah. And I like that feeling, you know, like this feels like my job and it feels good to, you know, it feels good when your art feels like work. I love that. It just, not that I, that, not that I need to have that validated necessarily, but it's just, you know, coming from a very blue collar background, that feels very good to me. Mm. And, and recording does too, up to a point, but you know what I mean? Touring feels like real physical work. And and I I love that. And you have to be there. Like you have a commitment to keep, don't you? Yes, right. There's, yep, exactly. How's your relationship with your audience changed over the years? Do you, do you feel it's changed? Is, has it deepened? Has it changed because of the internet? Deepened. That's one, yeah. For one thing, I feel like the line, the construct of fan and artist has changed so much. I feel like a real kinship with people now. Shows just feel like a community to me now, instead of just like, I'm just a, a lab rat or, <laughs> or a performing animal. <laughs> it feels like that line has blurred and sometimes just doesn't even exist. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like we're sort of all in it together. And that's new, I want to say, in the past few years that I've felt that, you know, I feel like that's a, a new and wonderful dynamic. Your music has been with people for a number of years and, then, and in a way everyone's grown up together. Yeah. And the music you've created has, has created this community around it, obviously overlapping with other artists and whatever. Yes. But there's a lovely Facebook group Is it called Shimmer. Yeah, and a lot of those people are who I'm talking about, you know, just who have become friends. Yeah. That community really personifies what I'm talking about. Just sort of, and and also another thing that's really lovely too is just in some ways, you know, the band can be peripheral to that. You know, I feel in a really healthy way, like that they've got their own connections now that, that don't necessarily include us, you know, which is kind of nice also that it's become something bigger than us. I think that's really good. And I've been writing these weekly emails to my community. And sometimes people write back to me and they're like, oh, it's really cool that you seem to really care about your fans. And it's like, that word seem is so strange to me because none of it's an act. None of it's like a, oh, no, actually, you're walking pound signs. But I thought I'd pretend that we're friends so that you buy my next album. (laughs) Because I don't come from a background of having had a big career on a label Mm -hmm. and then suddenly this faceless multitude becomes yeah you know real people at a gig it's it's very much the other way around so it's it's lovely to hear that people I mean I knew that about you anyway you're great but to hear that people who have been through the sort of very highs of record label expensive videos and all that stuff Mm. can maintain a career after years of doing it and have that kind of connection with people that's very real because what else is there? In my, in my mind, what else is there? Yeah, it's a really nice place to be. I mean, it, uh, it, it moves me. It just really moves me. <laughs> I'm actually getting teary. Wow. Like just that, um, that relationship with people. Uh, I'm so grateful for it. And, I, you know, we never take it for granted. We're just, it's just an incredibly fortunate place to be, you know. Yeah, it is. It is lovely. Someone posted a picture today on Twitter of himself um, in hospital. He's going through some chemo at the moment and he tagged a load of artists he was listening to today. I was in the list and I was like, I I cried. Yeah, 
I have no yeah. shame in crying at that. And I said, thank you so much for including me. And right. that's the magic that w- would have been happening before, but you wouldn't have been hearing about it on Twitter because it didn't exist, right? So I think your music's always touched people like that. Oh, well, that's kind It's that kind of music. Did I tell you the, the very breathless and embarrassed story about how I first heard Belly? No, I don't think so. Maybe you did. I think I did. I think when I met you for the first time, I was like, <laughs> I've got to tell her. <laughs> Without sounding like a total fool. And it was, I was browsing in my local library and that's how I found music. Oh, yeah, 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 you did tell When you're a kid, picking out the music you like seems to be the only choice there is, or it certainly did feel like that to me. Can't choose what you eat, can't choose what you wear, Mm -hmm. can't choose what you do day to day, but I could choose what I listen to. Right. And I I just picked up a Belly album. I can't remember which one it was, actually, but I just picked one up because it stood out. The artwork stood out to me. And I rented it from the library and I took it home and I turned it on and I heard your voice and it made me think I could be a singer too. Because because (laughs) before that... I'm determined to make you cry on this. So before are. that, all the stuff in, on the radio didn't sound like it was achievable or like attainable or even desirable for me to sound that way. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think that I could just sing the way I sang and it, like anyone would want to listen. And you gave me so much confidence and I will always be grateful. Well, I'm grateful to you for saying that. that and that is, I mean, uh, uh, one of the clear, like those moments when I hear that, that as, you know, especially from... A young woman, it really means everything. Just everything. So I would have tweeted you at the time. (laughs) I know, you know, I have to say, in spite of the fact that social media can just be an endless Jacob's ladder of missteps and apologies and regret and more apologies and (laughs) um I feel like it's just the positive greatly outweighs the negative for me. Just the connectivity is priceless. Yeah, definitely. I always get very excited when you retweet Juliana Hatfield, who I know you're Mm -hmm. obviously friends with, because it makes me think, wow, those two cool ladies sit around like jamming all the time, (laughs) which may or may not be true, but in my mind, it's true. You're just always hanging out, singing together. Does that happen? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to do do that. We haven't done that in a long time. Time She was actually here a few weeks ago before the shutdown and just, you know, as we were starting to feel like this was going to happen and she's like, this, you know, this, I don't think this is going to change my life very much. <laughs> she's great. Her great uh, experience with social distancing as a rule. <laughs> My life isn't changing day to day apart from the existential horror backdrop, which is, yeah, is new. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just such a weird thing. Oh, so, it's so weird that it's happening every now and again. I'm like, what? <laughs> what's going I on? I know. Yeah. It's just waking up every day. I feel like I have to recalibrate every morning, you know, and just take a few breaths, go out in the yard, look up at the sky. Um, just that's the very first thing that I've been doing so that just to sort of like um, keep any potential panic at bay. To me, it feels like when someone dies and you wake up in the morning yeah. and you haven't remembered yeah, yet. Yeah. Yes. There's like those few moments of, mm-hmm. oh, good morning. Oh, good morning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the heart starts to race and I just get myself outside as quickly as possible. <laughs> That's smart. Yeah. This is not an ad. I just wanted to stop for a sec to send my love and thanks to every single member of the Correspondence Club. They're the people powering my indie rock solo project, Penfriend, and this podcast too. When I launched the project, I wanted to invite music fans on board from the very start. So I created a members club with free and paid monthly tiers and loads of cool perks from music to enamel badges, zines, secret podcast episodes and online gigs. We even have a friendly online forum to hang out in where we discuss music, books, poetry and all sorts of other things. It's lovely you would be very welcome to join us. Visit penfriend.rocks for more. But first, back we go to my conversation with the rather wonderful Tanya Donnelly. You've played a lot of gigs. Do you know how many? No. No idea. You don't keep a list? No. I don't know how many. No, I have to go, like, I have to go onto the internet sometimes to look at, like, 
other people's accounting of tour dates and stuff so that I can see where I was when. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that people do that. Sometimes. I know it's a, <laughs> it's a real service. <laughs> Are there any gigs that really stand out to you as being like super exciting or like really memorable ones? I mean, some of those standout ones for different types of excitement and different reasons for standing out. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people open for us, both the Muses and Belly, um, who skyrocketed past us quickly. <laughs> um, and so I think those moments where, you know, the Cranberries tour, the Pixies tour, the Sundays, Radiohead, um, these examples of people who you see them at Soundcheck for the first time and it's just you get that feeling, mm. that future feeling and just that that's really exciting, you know, to see mm -hmm. to see someone who's opening for you just killing it and just really just that excitement of, oh, this is really important what I'm looking at right now, you know. Um, so that's exciting. And then of course like back in the day opening for REM, you know, touring with REM, who meant so much to us, you know, when we were young, to opening for the Velvet Underground and U2, you know, moments like that that just feel somewhat surreal. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. But uh, absolutely, I'm going to say that REM, the first REM tour, just, we were just, you know, astounded to be asked to do it and then just to be playing with them meant so much and did it feel like that at the time did you feel the excitement I'm getting the tingly feeling that I had when, I, when it happened oh, just yeah you were so young mm -hmm. when all that stuff was happening did do you remember really taking it in at the time or did it start to feel normal it never felt normal no and and I did I mean I remember thinking to myself like remember this feeling and remember this feeling um yeah. But it never, yeah, no, I never, I never started to feel like, well, of course we're opening for the Velvet Underground. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, we were, I've just, yeah. I've always, <laughs> I've always been shocked and amazed by every gift. <laughs> I feel that way too. I met Peter Buck last year because I supported Filthy Friends. And he was so nice. Isn't he the loveliest person? Yeah. That's another thing too, is just the kindness and generosity of those people, every single one of them. They're just the loveliest people. It really gives me hope because some people are really not lovely. Mm hmm And you just wonder why. Right. Life doesn't have to be so miserable on tour. Yep. They just don't really do do it right. They've just, they just figured it out and they figured out life and they nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Great people. Maybe some swan songs with them? <laughs> Get your mate's radio head on the phone, maybe? I'm getting that scared feeling. <laughs> That'd be so cool, though. No, I mean, yeah, maybe I would reach out to Peter. Hmm. You've got so many famous friends. You just have to choose, choose which ones you want, I guess. One thing about this one song series was just like, you know, I would laugh with Dean because it's sort of like, you know, at the end of every... You get together with people, you do a show with people, you see people out, you're like, we should do, you know, there's that end of the night, we should do something, we should write something. And then I just was like, you know what, I'm going to gracelessly start following up on those conversations. That's the only way that it happens, though. You have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this podcast is something I've been thinking of doing for... I want to say six years. And imagine if I had done it six years ago, that would have been really good. But I didn't have the confidence to ask anyone. I really just wanted to have those conversations that, I mean, we've never had time to sit and chat for this long about this kind of stuff. And it, yeah, I'm asking you questions, but yeah, but it's just about having a good conversation, really, because there's always an amp to carry or, you know, something going on and or, or the situation isn't right. So right. I feel like musicians could be having these conversations a lot more if there was I don't know, more time or less amps or I don't know. <laughs> Seems like a shame. More time, less amps. <laughs> That's great. And they could all be collaborating too. Yeah. And I think there's also a big piece of, you know, getting out of your own way. 100%. <laughs> that can't be overestimated. You know, the, the, the poison of your little inner critic, you know, 
is just, we all have it. That leaner critic is still, still there, just, you know, who do you think you are, you know? Yeah. But I feel like as I've gotten older, I've started to really narrow down the counsel I seek, you know? I seek just the input of people that I care about, whose opinions I care about. Um, and you become, I think, more and more immune to random advice from the outside and that poisonous advice from the inside. That voice inside gets louder and louder when you're routinely subjected to random opinion, you know? Yeah. But then over the years, that that sort of daily inoculation of unsolicited input sort of does start to thicken your skin. And I've just really funneled down who I let in to that, you know? Mm. I think I'm not expressing myself beautifully at the moment, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. If you've got an, a great idea for something, maybe do it without asking anyone if they think it's a good idea. Because... People won't understand your idea anyway unless it's done. Yes. So, I mean, I've, I've done yeah. it myself, obviously, many times. But I had a demo for a song called Undone from my last record. Mm -hmm. It's an acoustic demo. It's about 10 BPM too slow because that's how I always record things. And then I realize I've done it too slow and I've speed it up later. <laughs> and I could hear it in my head, like how it was going to be kind of nirvana -y, loud, you know, crunchy guitars, what have you. And I played it to my then manager and I played it to my husband. And they were both like, yeah. It's all right. But I was like, no, you're not hearing it, are you? You can't hear it. Um, yeah. And it's because I hadn't recorded it yet. Right, and so right. if, if I'd let those sort of unenthusiastic responses stop me from doing the song, mm -hmm. then that would have been really bad. Mm -hmm. But luckily I just went, okay, f I'll just prove it to you. I'm just going to do it. Yes. And then I did it. And then they got it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But I, you know, if I'd been younger or less strong minded about it or had sent it to too you many other people, it. exactly, then yeah, I probably would have gone oh no it's no good I'm no good I'm a bad person I shouldn't do this at all and then they stopped stop making music yeah Gail, Gail and I actually just made a pact just yesterday that no more disclaimers and caveats we're just sending stuff back and forth yeah that's good um, it takes too long yeah. to explain how how shit you are first how bad it is exactly here's this piece of garbage <laughs> that I just made now you have to listen to it yeah now you have to live it with me. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you were saying that you, you have a generally positive experience with social media because it can be really bad for our health in many ways. Well, I don't do Facebook anymore other than just that. That one was the one where I was like, oh, it is mean on here. You know, I just sort of Facebook. I only use for facts at this point. You know what I mean? Just news and information. And I am limiting my time on Twitter as, as well. And I've been doing a lot of muting, frankly. I really enjoy Instagram, I have to say. I feel like that's where a lot of the happiness went <laughs> to live. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's been positive experience for the most part. Mm, it's good to hear. Yeah. I really had to stop looking at feeds. That was what was getting me. Yes. And comments, never read comments. That's another thing. It's, I just don't read c comments on any, on anyone else's posts. <laughs> no, no, it's not worth it. It's funny that you say that you, you go to Facebook for facts though, because I know what you mean, because you're obviously reading links. <laughs> yes. but in my mind, Facebook is full of sort of the half thought you weren't going to share with your nearest loved one because they'd go, why are you telling me that? Yes. But you still make a post about it. You know? Right. And also, I just don't, I really just don't understand who has time to go attack pe people on their pages. I just, I don't understand what, yeah, what that impulse is at all. I've gone from being someone who would sit online most of the day, I mean, working on stuff, but also have tabs open for the different sites. Mm -hmm. Just all the time, default, that's how I lived. Right. To being someone who now I try to just choose when to sort of dip in and come out again. And my life's completely different mm -hmm. because of that. And yeah. it's, it's so much better. So, yeah, yeah. It's, but it's a process. So I think some people are going through that. Some people don't realize that that's that that's possible, you know. Right. Yeah. And especially now, though, to be connected is wonderful. But I still think it can be 
it can just be hard on the brain mm -hmm. all of this dopamine and too too much text yeah it just right <laughs> exactly can't hold on to all of those ideas at once yep yep but I'm glad you're having a nice time with it yeah it's funny because I you know I have to I assumed that I'd be on social on social media more since quarantine but I'm actually much less inclined to pick up my phone right now for whatever reason um and I think it's because I'm in here with my family and we all there, there's just a lot going on here right now it's you know it's weird it's I look at the phone you know two weeks ago I would have been checking in you know and I just I'm not yeah doing yeah I hope it doesn't seem unfriendly, but... <laughs> You're not unfriendly, Tanya, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from music, what else makes you happy in life? My children, my husband, my dog, my friends, my wonderful, you know, my friends who, you know, that's one that we have, I have been doing, I said I'm not on the phone and I'm not but I've been doing zoom do little zoom meetings with my with my people because my friendships are so deeply deeply important to me and so it's really people that I love that makes me happy and do you have any goals or like hobbies that aren't musical aren't music related hmm I kind of I mean, gardening, Dean and I are in getting into that. We have a yard for the first time. <laughs> um, reading, reading, reading. Um, if I have spare time for something that isn't necessary or essential, it's music that I go to. So That's cool. Yeah. I'm not crafty. Yeah, it's kind of just music. <laughs> Boring. So boring. Um, I think that's really good. Yeah. To me, music isn't, oh, better go and do some music. You know, <laughs> that's not what it is, is it? Yeah, right. Exactly. I love to cook. I do love cooking. I love cooking. Yeah. What's your favorite dish to cook? Um, I make a Vietnamese crab soup that I've tweaked over the years. Um, and uh, there's a sort of a ginger... Um, salmon that I make, sesame crusted ginger salmon. Oh, that sounds really That's, good. Yeah. <laughs> How intentional has your life been? Oh, God, that's a good question. Um, really not very. <laughs> I mean, I feel like um, I'm a person that works hard with what I'm given, you know, but I do also sort of tend to, to, to move from place to place pretty organically without a lot of, of decision-making and intention, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a combination of waiting and seeing and moving in a direction that feels right and then working hard once I'm there. Mm. But... I don't, I've never been someone that has a five-year plan, for instance. It's difficult to do in our, in our line of work. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, having the, that, you know, sort of like an ex, an expect, a calendar expectation can be extremely disheartening, you know. If anyone's listening who's never heard your music, which three songs would you direct them to? <gasps> Uh, this Hungry Life, Mass Ave, and uh, Low Red Moon. I'm going to change my mind in about 10 minutes, but that's, those are the first ones that just came to mind. Fantastic. Thank you. And which <laughs> other artists are you enjoying at the moment? Right now I'm listening to, we're all really trying to find something that is, you know, there's a lot of Ennio Morricone going on in the house because we all agree and love, love him. Um, Leonard Cohen always works for everybody. The Parkington Sisters, who I love very much. You have a record with them, right? Coming out soon? Yeah, we just finished it. Yes, really? just finished it a couple. Yeah, it's all covers and I'm really excited about it. 
I'm excited to hear that. It was really fun to do. They're amazing. We're listening to a lot of um, non-vocal music, to be honest, right now. Um, Dean is a big jazz fan, so there's a lot of that. And uh, S- Sister Rosetta Tharp been listening to a lot. I know I'm not naming anything new and that's doing a disservice to new music, but right now it's a lot of kind of comfort music. Yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) And as someone who has collaborated with a lot of people, Mm -hmm. if you could collaborate with any other artist, who would you choose? (laughs) Well, I think you and I need to write a song together. I really do. And I'm not just saying that. And Dean actually said... How come you guys have never written a song together? And I think we should do that. I'm stunned and excited. So I'm going to say you, girl. (laughs) Yeah, let's do it. Yes, please. Yeah. I wasn't even fishing for that answer, but I will take it. No, I know you weren't. I know know you weren't. But as I'm trying to dig for someone, I'm like, well, let's turn this into an invitation. Oh, my God. I'd love to do that. Yeah, let's do it. I'm in. I'm in. Let's do it. Conditions are perfect. Yes, they are. (laughs) That's what the song should be called. Um, Yeah, conditions are perfect. (laughs) Yeah, I would love to do that. Finally, Tanya Donnelly, what's your next adventure? Um, Making a big pot of soup for people who are in this house right now, probably. We're going to do an experiment, um, like, you know, like the... 500 year soup it's not going to be 500 years but we're going to make a stop like a base soup and just keep adding to it every day and see how long we can keep the soup alive so that's (laughs) i've never heard of that that's my quarantine experiment of the day yes well i'm a little bit concerned about the health of your family now is that safe (laughs) well you heat it and you heat it and it's never it's sort of like a river it's not really going to be the same soup in a week but right it's technically there's like a a continuum to it well i hope that um we do get to write this song (laughs) because we'll see how it goes (laughs) i don't know that that's safe (laughs) Good luck with the soup experiment. I like bacteria soup. All right, and on that note, um, I will thank you so much for your time. All right, darling. It was nice talking to you as always. And send me some music. All right. I'd love to write a song. Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's do it. All right. All right, love you. Love you too. Thank you so much for listening to the first episode of Attention Engineer. And thank you to Tanya for being a wonderful guest. She has so much great work available, from the Belly albums to the Tanya Donnelly solo albums, the Swan Song series and her latest Lockdown Sunday series, raising money for a different organisation every week. I've made a special page on my website for this episode, so head to penfriend.rocks forward slash Tanya for all of these links and to see a special note she wrote for you. You can even listen to us singing together. I make this podcast and all the featured music myself. You can get free songs, access podcast extras and support future podcasts and music making by joining the Correspondence Club. Episode 2 of Attention Engineer is available now, featuring a warm and inspiring conversation with Mark Chadwick from The Levelers. If you like what you've heard so far, please subscribe and I look forward to bringing you more great conversations with great people. Bye for now.